Okay, I have a problem of turning on my camera. I can only turn on the camera for the Surface tablet. So only the Surface tablet camera can be turned on. I don't know what the reason is. My surface tablet, put it flat on the surface, you're gonna see the ceiling of my room. Face, couldn't turn the other camera on. I don't really know what the root reason is. Technology always puzzles me. Okay, you're gonna see the ceiling of my room instead of my face. Are you going to see a, a picture of myself? That's all. Okay, I, I don't know what the reason is. But let's get started then, if I couldn't figure out the reason. Uh, let me share my screen. So today I'm going to talk about reciprocity theorem, which is a very important theorem in electromagnetics. Uh, it can be mathematically derived, and I will tell about the conditions for reciprocity and applications to a two-port network and circuit theory, and talk about some of the other things if I have enough time. But reciprocity is like the Tit for tat relationship for human beings. Uh, if you are good to me, I will be good to you. And if I, if you're bad to me, I will be bad to you. And we, this wisdom has been exposed in many different cultures. Uh, in the Chinese culture, it was exposed by Confucius during the Western Han Dynasty. And in the Western culture, you can find it in the Bible, in the New Testament. If you were to read Luke and Matthew, you'll find this uh, kind of uh, wisdom being exposed in the Bible as well. Okay, the essence of the wisdom is that never to impose on others what you would not choose for yourself. Okay, and you find this relationship to be true between antennas as well. And let's see how we can derive this uh, in relationship. So let's assume that we have a medium. The medium is rather complicated. It can be made of metal. It can be made of uh, something very, very complicated. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to draw that medium, but you can imagine for yourself that this permittivity tensor and this permeability tensor can represent some very, very complicated structure. And these two tensors can be a function of positions. And what is more important is that it can include conductivity in these tensors as well. So this could be a metallic structure, like your antenna structure and so on. And let's do two experiments to prove reciprocity theorem. I'm going to first assume that I have J1M1 and J1M1 are uh, impressed sources. Okay. And J2M2 are also impressed sources. Impressed sources are sources in Maxwell's equations such that when you put them into Maxwell's equations, they are not altered by the environment. 
no matter what your environment you have, they're just something that you put it in there and nothing changes. And let's assume that what surrounds this medium is a vacuum or free space. Okay, and we're gonna do two consecutive experiments. The experiment one is when we turn J1, M1 on, and then J1, M1 on, and then J2, M2 off. Okay, we're gonna turn off this second set of courses, uh, sources. And then in experiment two, we're gonna turn J1, M1 off, and then J2, M2 on. Okay, so you do these two experiments consecutively and assuming that they're time harmonic sources, you can let them run for a while before you reach the sinusoidal steady state. And then we can write down Maxwell's equations in the frequency domain and derive reciprocity theorem from that. And what would be Maxwell's equations in the frequency domain? Well, when we have experiment one, uh, then what we have is that Maxwell's equation satisfies this equation, curl of E1 equals minus J omega mu. Mu is a complex permittivity tensor. It can be rather complicated. Uh, mu dot with the magnetic field H1. And then I have my sources being M1 and J1. Okay. And similarly, the magnetic field has to satisfy this equation and then is J omega epsilon dot E1. Let me write my J properly, uh, plus J1, okay? This is my experiment one, mathematically expressed. And then uh, I can do experiment two, mathematically expressed, it would be curl of E2, minus j omega mu. Re just remember that mu and epsilon do not change. That means that we're doing this experiment in the same environment of the medium, only the field changes and the source changes. So I'm gonna put M2 in the second experiment and then I'm going to uh, do the same for the magnetic field. I right, just have to change them to uh, with the subscript two instead of a subscript one. And then I will have this, okay. And you can understand that mu and epsilon do not change, but the sources change in these two equations and the field changes. So it corresponds to the two experiments or the German call it a Gedanken experiment. It just corresponds to the two thought experiments. The Duncan experiments means thought experiments, okay? And then I'm going to derive reciprocity theorem uh, by doing some mathematical manipulation. I'm going to dot multiply this equation by H2, okay? And then I'm going to dot multiply this equation by E1. And I have some hindsight to do this because I'm uh, using the wisdom of our predecessors to formulate this derivation. Uh, the reason why I want to do that is because I want to find the divergence of uh, E1 cross H2. If I take the divergence of E1 cross H2, then using the identity for the Brock uh, dot product of divergence of cross product. And you can look this up in the tables of formulas and you will find that this would be just like the product rule, but product rule applied to vector products instead of scalar products. Okay. So this should be, let me put it more properly. And this should be one. So the reason 
when I did that was because I'm looking for a substitute for this expression on the right hand side, which is found in this equation as well as in that equation. So if I substitute the above two equations onto the right hand side, and if you do that carefully, making no mistakes, then you will have J omega H2 dot with mu. Mu is the same, so it remains to be with a subscript. And then the second term will come from this one using the second equation, it will be minus J omega E1 dot epsilon dot E2. Okay, just imagine that you take H2 in the product into here, and then you take uh, that term down, it will have this. And then the second one, you take E1 in the product and this one and take it down and they will become this one over here. And then what is left over is actually the, um, the source term. Okay, the source term is H2 dot M1, which I find on the right hand side of the first equation. And then the other one is uh, minus E1 dot J2, okay? So I can do the same thing for the second experiment. I can repeat the same thing for the second experiment, but I put E2 cross H1 in state. And by symmetry, I'm just uh, substituting the two subscripts one and two. So I just need to switch the subscripts in these equations on the right hand side. And then the second term here would be E2 dot epsilon dot E1. And then the last two terms will be H1 dot M2 minus E2 dot J1. Okay, so these two equations are quite easy to derive. And if I can subtract the two equations, I get something simpler. Before I subtract the two equations, I want to assume certain thing. The thing is that mu is going to be mu transpose. I'm going to assume that epsilon to be equal to epsilon transpose. That means that the symmetric, the symmetric matrices or symmetric tensors, since matrices and tensors are the same, okay? So if I assume that to be the case, then you can quite easily see that, uh, well, uh, these two terms are the same because in matrix algebra, if we were to if we were to take the transpose, like H two dot mu dot H one is a scalar number. Say so it's a scalar number, and if I take the transpose of a scalar number, uh, it becomes itself in matrix algebra, and matrix algebra has a very simple theorem that if I have three matrices, it doesn't matter what dimension these matrices are, as long as you can take their inner product and form a product, you might end up with a matrix at the end, uh, but if you were to take the transpose of this expression, it would be the same as, this not right one, C transpose dot B transpose dot A transpose. Okay, this is something that you should have learned from matrix algebra or linear algebra. And it's quite easily proved too. If you're not convinced, you can go and prove that to yourself. Okay, that this is always true. So what this means is that uh, if this scalar number is equal to that, and if I apply this uh, matrix algebra or linear algebra rule, then this is the same as H1 dot mu 
dot H2. Okay. In physics, the transpose is never explicitly expressed or assumed. For instance, in physics, uh, this is written like this, but actually in mathematics, this should mean this. Except that in physics, you do not explicitly put this transpose there. It's kind of understood. Okay, so when we have inner products like this, just like when we have inner products like this between two vectors in physics, the transpose is assumed on the second vector, is implied, okay? We just don't put there. So this actually implies that, and you can apply this relationship, you can prove that these two are actually the same as each other. And now if you subtract the two equations, this one and that one, these two terms will cancel each other. So would these two terms, they will cancel each other. And what is remaining then is just the last term, okay? So if you have symmetric tensors, then the subtraction of the two equations give you a new identity, which is E1 cross H2 minus E2 cross H1 is equal to, the subtraction on the right hand side, most of which disappear, uh, just leaving the source terms behind, and it will be H2 dot M1 minus E1 dot J2, that is coming from the first equation. And then you will have something like plus H1 dot M2 plus E2 dot J1, okay? This is a very important relationship. It is the precursor to some reciprocity relationship that we're going to derive very soon, okay? Let's circle this. And you see that in order to arrive at this relationship, this is important. Without this assumption, we would not have arrived at this simplification. So the condition for arriving at this relationship, which is the precursor to reciprocity theorems of different kinds, the necessary condition is that mu equals mu t, epsilon equals epsilon t, okay? Are there any questions on this before we move on? Okay, so let's, derive the first reciprocity relationship, which is called the Lorentz reciprocity relationship. And in this relationship, uh, we put a surface S that is not surrounding the sources. We deliberately choose the surface S not to include the sources. And if you do that, then uh, if you were to integrate this equation now that we have on the left-hand side, and integrate it over the volume V, but the volume V does not contain the sources, okay? Then you will arrive at the relationship that does not involve the right-hand side, and they can perform the volume integral, and you will find that the volume integral only includes the volume integral on the left-hand side, and the left-hand side is a divergence, an exact divergence, so you end up with the right hand side be zero, okay? If I were to integrate the whole equations on the previous slide over the volume V not containing the sources, then I would have just uh, to begin with uh, the volume integral of E1 cross H2 minus E2 cross H1 is equal to zero, okay, over V. But since I pick my V not to contain the sources and I can convert this into a surface integral and this will be the same as N dot E1 cross H2 minus H2 cross H1, uh, E2 cross H1. Okay, this relationship is called the Lorentz reciprocity relationship.
I have written up out there as well, but let me just rewrite it again. So it can be used in many applications. Uh, for instance, in the waveguide, uh, you can derive very interesting relationship between modes in the waveguide. If you have a waveguide, for instance, uh, you might have two different modes, E1, E2, uh, H1, H2, and then you can pick your volume V to be something like this in the waveguide that contains no sources. And you can see that the relationship between E1 and H2 simplifies to this very interesting relationship, which is almost like the power flow, but not exactly power flow, because there's no complex conjugation on the H. If it's a power flow, then it would be E1 cross H2 complex conjugate, but the complex conjugate is not there. And usually uh, we say this to be the reaction, okay? Uh, let's see, we have derived one reciprocity relationship. The other one is the reaction reciprocity relationship, which I would put here. A reaction reciprocity relationship is obtained when I pick the volume V to contain the sources. Okay, if I pick the volume V to contain the sources, uh, then I should not have left, I should not have make the right-hand side go to zero like in the previous derivation. In the previous derivation, I make the right-hand side go to zero because I exclude those sources in my volume integral. But then I will have something on the right-hand side here. I will have something on the right-hand side and to say it more explicitly, uh, then I would have a relationship that looks like, uh, if I were to write it down again, that uh, E1 cross H2 minus E2 cross H1. And this is the left-hand side and it was integrating over the surface S, and then it should be equal to the right-hand side, which is very complicated, okay? It would have a volume integral. Let me not write the typical integrals so, but just the reaction between the sources, okay? These are called reactions. And then E1 comma J2 plus H1 comma M2 plus E2 dot J1. Okay, so I will have this thing that is not equal to zero on the right hand side. And I'm going to do one more trick to make this expression look very simple. Okay, I'm going to let S tend to infinity. Let S tend to infinity. And if I do that, you can actually show that the left-hand side goes to zero. The left-hand side goes to zero. And I'm not going to show that in this lecture, okay? It's something that often happens. And what you can do is that you can show far field approximation. E1, H1, E2, H2 are in the far field. So if E1, H1, and E2, H2 are in the far field of the sources, essentially they become like spherical waves or plane waves. Okay, they become like spherical waves or plane waves. And you can show that these two actually, if you plug in plane wave expressions between E1, H2, E2, H1, uh, they go to zero, which I have shown in the lecture. Okay, and I'm not gonna show it here. And then we are going to have a very simple relationship then. If S tends to infinity, we have the relationship that uh, the left-hand side is zero, the right-hand side must be equal to each other. And we can rewrite this relationship as uh, E2 dot J1 minus H2 dot M1. 
Okay, I'm going to first write the sources from experiment one on the left hand side. And then I'm going to write the sources from experiment two uh, on the right hand side. So this should be E1. Okay, these are all the sources from experiment two and then h1.m2. So this again is a very simple relationship. And it says that uh, if you were to do this experiments and find the inner product between the current and the field from the two experiments, they're equal to each other, okay? And this quantity here, E1 comma J1, it's very similar to inner product in linear algebra. And usually this is expressed as E2 comma J1, which is the inner product notation in electromagnetics. And this inner product is also called a reaction. Okay, it's also called a reaction. And it says that uh, the reactions between the sources are equal to each other. The, reactions between the source and the field of the two experiments are equal to each other, okay? And so oftentimes you would just write this uh, reciprocity relationship using this inner product notation. So it would be just H2 comma M1 is equal to E1 comma J2 minus H1 comma M2. Okay, let me write this more properly. Okay, so this is nice. Um, and then some people would even want to be more succinct than this. This is uh, E2, each one does feel from experiment two, reacting with the feel from the sources from experiment one, and it can be written as two comma one and then one comma two. Okay, these notations are too succinct. I don't really like them, but some people like to write these two reactions uh, as such. And you can see that uh, this is called the reaction reciprocity theorem. <coughs> and these reactions are called Ramsey reactions. Okay, Ramsey's reaction in this reciprocity theorem it's also sometimes called the Ramsey reaction theorem, okay? Because it is just the inner product between two sources, as I said before. Uh, if you think about this inner products, uh, they are very similar to inner products uh, in linear algebra. So if you have two vectors, A and B in linear algebra, the inner product is defined to be this in linear algebra, which is equal to a i b i i equals to one to n. Okay, and a reaction in the product, on the other hand, is that you just take the integral of two functions f x, uh, g x, and integrate. Let's assume that this function is defined in the interval between a and b. And this is what you would do in the reaction in the product, which is that you take two functions, uh, multiply them together, and then integrate over the volume in which these two functions are defined. And if you were to do this numerically, uh, you will have to uh, approximate this integral with summations on the computer. And you will have those expressions uh, been done, okay, you do some kind of uh, numerical quadrature approximation and say that this inner product numerically is similar to this inner product. And if you were to call this, uh, uh, if you put the data x into a vector f sub i, and then you can say that this is very similar to f tilde i, G tilde i, okay, where I took the delta x and put it 
half and half into each of them. And then this would be just the inner product between two vectors. Okay, so you can see that inner products that we have learned in linear algebra is very similar to the reaction in the product. And of course, you can generalize this to volume. Okay, you can generalize to volume and that can define inner product in the 3D space. Again, if you were to calculate this inner product, you will have to do numerical approximations such as this and they will just look like inner product in linear algebra. So are there any questions regarding reciprocity theorem, the two that we have learned so far? The Lorentz reciprocity theorem and then the reaction reciprocity theorem. If not, then I'll move on to discuss other things that are more interesting uh, and see how we can apply this to two-port network and circuit theory. Okay. Uh, so we have two antennas and we can assume that this antenna is driven by two horn, in, uh, this, uh, two horn antennas and then we are using these two horn antennas for communication. And we are doing communication over terrain. The terrain can be very complicated with permeability tensor and permittivity tensor that are functions of position. So the terrain can represent trees, earth, mountains, rocks, and everything that you can think of. It can also represent uh, antenna towers making up of metal and different kinds of wires. As long as the medium is reciprocal, then we can apply reciprocity theorem regarding the communication of these two antennas. Okay, so this characterizes a reciprocal medium. And then we're going to make things simpler for you so that uh, you can think of this medium that the antenna is part of that reciprocal medium. So you can essentially think of having a Hertzian dipole. Okay, you can think of having a Hertzian dipole here and a Hertzian dipole over here. And the Hertzian dipoles are so small that you can apply circuit theory in the vicinity of the Hertzian dipole. So you can actually amplify this part and define a voltage in the current associated with that port because the dipole is so small. And in the vicinity of that dipole, circuit theory applies. And then similarly over here, you can also think of the fact that circuit theory applies uh, and that the antenna structure, the horn antenna that you have used can be part of mu and epsilon that you have put into the medium. And, and again, I can, uh, I'm going to assume that this is in dipole impress. Current sources. And because the impressed current sources, uh, the theorem of reciprocity that we have derived can be applied here. Okay, so what it says is that if I were to do the experiments, two consecutive experiments, turning J1 on and J1, uh, J2 off, and then turning J2 on and J1 off, I'm going to assume M1 is equal to zero, M2 is equal to zero. Okay, in other words, I'm going to assume that no magnetic current sources are around, making this proof a lot simpler than the Reaction reciprocity theorem reduces to J2 comma E1 is equal to J1 comma E2, <coughs> which is something that we have concluded from the reaction uh, reciprocity theorem.
Okay. Then because of this thing, we can actually now replace this thing with actually a circuit problem. Okay, this could be anything that you have in between the transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna. We have a current J1 driving the input port, and then we have a current J2 driving the input port. Okay, and then this very complicated structure that we have can be something that is representing the terrain. Okay, it can also represent circuit board. So this can be the terrain. It can also be circuit board. If you were to go and work in a computer company, uh, you will have input and output sources, and you will use circuit theory uh, to describe this. And you can even have transmission lines. In this very complicated uh, medium in between, as long as all the things making up these circuits that we have, the terrains that we have, consist of reciprocal medium. Okay, as long as this is true, you can actually manufacture very, very complicated things out of this uh, experiment. And this is kind of a reduced representation of this very complicated experiments that you see there and everything has been distilled and, uh, and consolidated into this uh, picture over here, then usually we will call this port one in circuit theory and usually port two in circuit theory. And we will have very simple relationship in circuit theory. I hope that you have learned this before, which is that the Circuit really relationship between two ports are given by this one. Okay, so V1, V2, I1, I2 have to be related as such. And if you have not had circuit theory and you have problem accepting this, you can think of this as a most general relationship between two parameters and the most general relationship between these two parameters, V1, V2, I1, I2, is a matrix relationship. This is a linear relationship. And nothing is more general than this, okay? If, if this is a linear system, they can only be related in such a manner. Okay, linear time invariant system, LTI. Linear time invariant, and then you can express everything in the frequency domain in terms of just multiplication of numbers. Okay, no more convolutions and that kind of thing. Okay, so if this is the case, then um, I can prove that Z12 equal to Z21, okay? In other words, this matrix Z is symmetric, okay? So to prove this, then you are going to assume that you have a calculation of E2 comma J1. Now remember that J1 represents a small Hertzian dipole that you have used to drive this antenna, the horn antenna that you have in the previous picture. So E2 comma J1 needs only to be integrated over a very tiny volume where the Hertzian dipole is, okay? So this is something that you would integrate over a tiny volume where the Hertzian dipole is. Okay, and over this very tiny volume, since circuit theory prevails, and if you were to put a current here, this current can be assumed to be a constant, as you can see in your laboratory. If you were to do anything in your laboratory, if the frequency is uh, long enough, this is essentially a constant. And this will reduce to uh, J1 is a constant over the volume of integration. And then you can put this uh, E 
dot dl. Okay, there will be sorry, I would put a current. I can assume a current I1 is described in detail in the lecture notes. I'm not going to describe in detail, but the fact that this integration can be simplified to just an integration over the length of the wire. And you can show that this is I1 uh, V2 or V1 open circuit. Okay. And then you can do the same thing by doing the same experiment on this side. You will get I2 uh, V1 open circuit. And then you would get the fact that uh, you can do this same experiment on port two. Okay, you will get something like I2 V2 open circuit. Okay. And then by reciprocity, these two should be equal because they are the reactions in the two experiments. The reactions in the two experiments, and by using this, you can prove this. I'm not going to prove this here. You can prove it in your homework, okay? But it's all circuit theory based, okay? Uh, so if this terrain is made of reciprocal medium, uh, this matrix is symmetrical. So it has a tit for tat kind of relationship between the input and the output. And if you can easily transmit the signal from this port to that port, it says that you can also easily transmit the signal from this port to that port, okay? And this is a very important uh, reciprocity relationship for circuit theory. Uh, however, you can have circuits where this relationship is not true. For instance, you have isolators. And if you have a waveguide and you put some materials, ferrite, and then you put the magnetic field B, you get what we call a gyrotropic me medium. And you have seen previously that in the gyrotropic medium, uh, epsilon transpose is not equal to epsilon. Okay, because they look something like this, I, I don't recall epsilon one, epsilon two, and then you have I, uh, J, uh, epsilon three, uh, plus J epsilon three, okay? They are, they are lossless, okay? This relationship still is satisfied for a gyrotropic medium, but the reciprocal relationship is not satisfied. And hence for a ferrite, if you send a wave in this direction, it's not the same as if you send a wave in that direction. So you can make isolo, uh, isolators with ferrites. Okay, that is also a very important thing in electromagnetics. If you can make isolators, it means that you can isolate your electronic circuitry uh, from uh, some of the uh, attack or invasion or interference by uh, other signals. The signals can only travel one way, okay? This reduces interference. And you can only make isolators with non-reciprocal medium, okay? Uh, I like to talk about some hindsight as to what reciprocity means in terms of uh, linear algebra. Uh, so when you solve Maxwell's equations, you're actually solving behind, okay, <coughs> hidden from a plain view, a matrix equation system such as this. So we can think of this as our source one. And then when you do experiment two, then we are actually solving the second equation with a driven source two. Okay, so using linear algebra as a hindsight, what does reciprocity theorem means? It means that if I were to dot this thing with X2, X2 being the field or the solution that you found in solving Maxwell's equations, and then if I were to dot this with X1, and then if I subtract these two equations, and if A is symmetrical, 
if A is good A transpose, it means that matrix A is symmetric. Then if you subtract the two, you can easily show that the left-hand side is equal to zero. And then you have X2, sorry, this in linear algebra, we have to be careful. We always put in a transpose. Okay, otherwise uh, those people will not be happy with us. Okay, we, are not, we have to talk linear algebra language when we use their notation. Okay, so as we just subtract the two equations, we have this. And it says that uh, x2 dot b1 equals x1 dot b2. And again, I forgot to put the transpose thing. Okay. So you can think of this as the source field, field and source again. Okay. So this is more a succinct way of saying that E2 comma J1 equals to E1 comma J2, okay? So are there any questions regarding this? If not, I'd like to move on to the last topic. The last topic is actually the proof of the fact that transmit and receive patterns of an antenna is the same. If an antenna transmit really well in that direction, it also receives really well in that direction, okay? I don't think I have the time to go through the proof, but I will just outline the proof approximately and you can go and read up about it because I believe that at this stage of your learning, you have enough knowledge to follow the proof in the lecture notes quite easily. And we have shown that the, the power radiated by antenna in a time average sense is the total power over four pi r square times the gain function. Okay, if you go back and read your lecture notes, that's what uh, we have actually uh, shown. The gain function is a comparison of the radiated power uh, over the isotropic case. So this is an isotropic radiator. Okay. And it turns out that when you use this as a transmitter, then this, the antenna, okay, the antenna will produce an SR very far away from the source. And this R, if you use an antenna as a receiver there, then this SR will become an incident power on the second antenna. So SR becomes S incident on the receiving end. This is transmitter, this is receiver. So SR becomes incident power at the incident end. Then the power received is defined by SR times AE, the effective aperture, or it can also be written by S incident times AE. Okay, this is what we learned. The power incident times the effective aperture is the power received. And then if you go through the thought processes and you can actually show that the AE, the effective aperture over the gain function is a constant, a universal constant. in the sense that this constant is not dependent on the shape of the antenna. Their constant is lambda squared over four pi. Okay, it does not depend on the shape of the antenna. It doesn't depend on how you make the antenna as long as you make the antenna out of the reciprocal medium. This relationship is always true. And I just want you to know this relationship before we leave this section, okay? And you can prove this relationship for some simple antenna like a Hertzian dipole quite easily. And since it's a universal constant, you can use this constant for all other antennas that you will encounter in the future. Are there any questions before I let you go? Any questions? 
Let me see. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, nobody has any questions. Then, Jung Liu, do you have any questions? Um, not, not at the moment. But I uh, uh, was wondering if when when you would be available for. Yeah, I will send you an email regarding that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then you if you don't have any question, I let you go. I don't know why my camera doesn't work well today. Okay. I let you go and enjoy yourself and uh, take good care and be safe because it's still not safe out there, according to what they hear from the news. And I'm, be, I might be planning on a outdoor meeting with you, you guys on Wednesday afternoon. If you're in town, we can plan on an outdoor meeting uh, near the Star, uh, Starbucks coffee uh, stand in MSEE, facing the uh, I guess we call it the engineering fountain. Okay, I'll send you more information on that later on. Okay, I'll let you go. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, bye-bye.